Okay, as promised, we are on time. <laughs> exactly. I, yeah. So, um, hello everyone, and welcome to the first Play UK webinar titled The Value in, in the Art Direction with our guest Luna Cimento. Hey. Uh, we're really delighted that you are here with us today for this first of many conversations with uh, UK gaming professionals, all which are brought to you by British Council. Uh, I am Ljubica and I will be your host and moderator uh, for today. So uh, Play UK is a festival of um, innovation and interaction between arts and technology with a focus on the games industry. And as a response to the current situation in the world, the British Council has transformed Play UK into a digital event, which everyone who is online can visit and enjoy. So uh, we have prepared a lot of interesting content for you uh, for the next five months, actually. And you can find all about it on the British Council website. But for starters, uh, every last Wednesday in the month, we will have a live masterclass like this, a 90-minute session uh, hosted by um, UK's uh, leading indie games creatives who will share their knowledge and their expertise in various elements of game development. Uh, we really hope that the content we prepared uh, will inspire you to uh, will inspire you on your career journey and really motivate you to uh, further explore uh, the gaming industry and its opportunities. So, um, as I said, like our today's guest is Luna Cimento, co-founder mm -hmm. and art director of uh, Bunnica Games. And today she will uh, walk you through her process of creating art direction for your indie game, all while finishing up a pixel art piece. Uh, but before we get started, uh, I have a few uh, service information. So uh, the webinar will run for about 90 minutes. It is being recorded, recorded and it will be available later on the British Council website and its YouTube channel as well. Uh, so Lou will be working on her pixel art piece. And once she has finished, we will jump in, we will start the Q&A session. But uh, please don't be shy and don't hesitate to ask questions throughout the webinar, not just during the, the Q&A session. Um, the way you can ask questions is to go to the toolbar at the bottom of your screen and type in your questions in the chat. And I will make sure to get through all your questions. Okay, so we're all here, we're, we are all ready to begin. So Lou, thank you so much for being with us today. Hey, thanks for having me. Uh, so could we start with you telling us a bit uh, about yourself and what you will actually be showing us today? Of course. Uh, oh, I think there's a bit of reverberation on the sound. How, how is it now? Can Let me you... see. Yeah, it's better. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, so um, hi, I'm Luna Smetua. I've been working as an artist for 10 years and seven of those have been in the games industry. I I am originally from Brazil. I I lived in Canada, South Africa, and now I live in the UK. Uh, recently, roughly a year ago, I, I co-founded Bunny Hug Games after we got fully funded by, by a publisher here in the north, north of the UK called CodeSync. And the project that we're doing right now is very unannounced. So I'm sorry if I show like really sketchy images of censored <laughs> stuff as examples. It's just, I didn't want you to have no examples. Okay, you can also like give us the vaguest answers ever. <laughs> so we, will, we understand the importance of keeping your project yeah. on the low. Yeah, so most of the those, actually the entire career that I worked in with games, I worked in very small teams from two to 20 people. And most most of them were indie games. Some was advert games, some was educational, but most indie games. And my teammates were always remote and all over the globe. So I hope my experience can kind of help you guys. You guys. And I'll, I'm gonna touch on why it should take some time to determine the art direction uh, of your game and like make documents and prepare everything and talk to your team members and like 
re really be in sync with everyone that, that you're working with. Uh, I'm gonna walk you through what you need to, like, why you should have it. So like, I'm gonna try to compel you to do those documents. I'm gonna, I'm gonna start uh, how to get started on creating those documents the production itself and the very underrated aspect of communicating. <laughs> yeah, that's important. Yeah, for yeah. You. Uh, awesome. I really look forward uh, to the to the next hour uh, of your of your lecture. So, um, shall we turn the video on? And also, yeah. like while you are uh, uh, while you are talking, you can all, you will also be walking us through your your art piece. Yeah, of course. Uh, just a uh, heads up, in case the video is not working very well, I'm going to drop the link, a YouTube link to it on the chat. Awesome. Just in case it stutters. And there we go. So just just before I start in everything, uh, um, what I'm doing on screen is I was preparing an art piece, like a pixel art, art piece, but I always started with 2D because I wanted I want you the idea should flow flat fast and I'm not be obsessing over small details. So that's me like exploring different sketches and exploring different colors. Yeah. So now I'm gonna talk about the importance of art direction in indie games and why why you should take time to do to do everything that I mentioned. Yeah, before Number we one, jump into that, could you uh, could you uh, like tell us ex explain us actually like what is it that an art director actually actually does and why is it important to have that role especially in a um, in a small team? I think that in small teams people usually like tend to do like five to six different roles and um, <laughs> Like what is uh how do you do it at, how do you do it at Bunny Hug? So in indie teams, what, what an art director usually does is there is still people management. So you're as a director, you're managing people first. So you're organizing, like uh, doing a little bit of production, setting tasks, uh, making sure that everything that is received you give feedback on, and you make sure it's following what the intent of the art is for the game. Uh, in bigger companies, a lot of times our direction is only the, the managing aspect and not, nothing else. In case of indie games, what I have found is that you tend to do a lot of like pre-production art, you tend to do a lot of concept art and stuff like that. So things that would in like in triple A games would be split between several layers of management and artists you end up doing yourself. And a lot of times you, uh, as an art director, like at, at least a bunny hug, I'm very responsible for making sure the tone of the game is kept throughout the entire development. So even though it's not necessarily art because uh, we don't have a, a writer full time, I'm the person that goes there and say like, maybe this story beat or maybe the way we want to approach this boss is going really far away from the proposal of the game itself. So I do a little bit of everything, including UI. I, like because I'm the only 2D person at Bunny Hug, I do UI, UX, I do concept art, I do marketing art, everything. And I think that tends to be the case for a lot of indie indie teams. Awesome. Yeah, but the aspect of like managing people and uh, like setting up the, the the project pipeline the project management basis yes. and also feedbacking people is a, a super important uh, aspect of the work which i think that uh, uh, most of the people simply don't pay enough attention to when thinking about th this position yeah definitely like the the pipeline in my case more often than not it was me just giving simple instructions and because right now I'm working with 3D art and I'm not a 3D artist, I work directly with the 3D artists in the in the the company to make sure the things are implemented right. And sometimes I sometimes you even have to to do things like if your 3D artists or your tech artists are very busy with something, you're gonna have to take over like implementing stuff for them. So you kind of like 
it's a, it's weird because you kind of become an assistant as well to make sure that everything is running smoothly for everyone else. Uh, and you said that like documenting uh, everything helps uh, actually for things to run smoothly, but we will touch upon that in your in your talk. Yeah. Uh, can we go back to the to the piece a bit? Like a lot has happened on the screen. Oh yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> during my questions. So what happened in the piece is that I did three, I usually do three to four sketches in every single piece that I have in mind. And I try, I have like an idea. This one, I had a rough idea that I wanted some dogs walking on a path with like a beautiful sky on the background and some trees arching, but like I didn't, and I had like this idea of being framed in the way that is being shown right now, but I didn't know exactly how. So I always do a lot of try and error and experimentation. So, and right now what, what is being shown is that I'm testing different colors. Usually I test a lot of color palettes. In this case, I just like, I ended up falling in love with the like pink and purple and the like bluish tones in this, uh, in this. so it's the one that I'm gonna go with. But yeah, I, every single piece, so I don't spend time like redoing things over and over again, I always give like every single idea that I have a try before I get actually started. Uh, while picking, um, while picking, for example, a color palette for your uh, art piece, I mean, for, for the art of your game, uh, mm -hmm. is that a thing that you also uh, research uh, while, um, uh, while in that uh, idea slash research part, part for your game, like, and, yeah, and how important is it, like, like to convey the, um, uh, the idea, the, I don't know, can, can I say like the, the feeling of the game to, to the players? For example, we, we know that, uh, I don't know, a company that I work in uh, does a lot of games for, for elderly women. And you, and you know, like the palette has to include like blue, purple, and let's avoid the yellow one. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Was, it's something that I'm going to touch on later as well. It's extremely important for that direction. It's like, for me, because I'm so connected to color, I, I like you mentioned, like each, uh, each person, like each target audience have a preference for palettes and like certain palettes and certain groups of colors bring a different mood to, to a project. And a thing that I always do on every single project of mine is like, as I do concept art and as I do the, the trials and errors, I start setting up a palette and after a while in the project, I kind of don't allow myself to add any other color to that palette to make sure everything is gonna be like very nice and consistent and like, it's just gonna feel very put together overall instead of like me adding more colors and adding more colors. And at the end of the day, the entire game is a rainbow and it's not saying much. Okay. Yeah. So. Uh, yeah, shall we resume the video? Yeah. Yeah. and. Um, I'm going to kind of like try to defend why, like, even in a small team, you, you should do the whole art direction thing. So number one for me, it's like consistency, because unless you, it goes against your game's own proposal, like the upcoming Super Mash, which is like they do different, different areas of gaming and different, uh, different art styles are in the game because it is actually the proposal of the game. The argument for keeping like the, your game art consistency is very, very strong because it creates a very strong held together identity that makes it much easier to market. And it's easy to spot visually, like especially nowadays that most of the marketing is done through social media. And it's like everything needs to grab your attention really fast on Twitter, for example, which is a, like a major uh, social media tool for, for, game, for game marketing right now. And it makes the entire game looks like it belongs together. I also mentioned before with the palette, but in this case, like with the entire art style of the game, if you have like a game that have very varied worlds, worlds like a level that has a volcano, a level that is under the sea and like jungle, even, even if you have all of that, you need to be able to spot a screenshot of the game and think, oh, it's that game, that game that I love or that game that I want to play. So it's like, is very important marketing wise, but also 
consistency also brings like a beauty, even if your game is not like the most gorgeous thing. And another thing is that it can elevate every single aspect of a game. Uh, what I always say is that a beautiful game doesn't necessarily mean it's going to be well art directed. That should always support the gameplay, not suppress it at all. Uh, their direction should be working hand in hand with all other aspects of the game to be effective because uh, games are multimedia experiences after all. So an example of what I, what I mean is like, you're making a platformer, the four uh, ground platforms uh, the player can step on need to have like some contrast to the background elements that, uh, so they can, so the background is not perceived as a platform as well. Being able to distinguish gameplay elements and non-gameplay elements while building cohesion across the art will make it feel very natural to the player. So it's not gonna have to be overthinking every little aspect that they see in the screen because it would be very frustrating if you like, you have every single platform that you can step on has like a black outline and all of a sudden there is a, something that is not steppable on that has a black outline. It becomes very frustrating because the player wants to go there because you guided them through, your, through their eyes like that. And, and another argument for setting up documents and setting up um, like color palettes and stuff like that is that it gives you very easy to, to reach answers for future questions that you're gonna come up with. When you properly document uh, uh, your game art and you make like standards for every single thing that's gonna show up in your game, you get benefits of making it easier to, for the development to flow when you're like in the break of actually developing a game. Like if everyone is rushing and you have a deadline, you don't need to keep reinventing the wheel and thinking, oh, how do I do a tree for this, for this game? You will actually know you have like a, a document to go reference to. Uh, if your team works in different parts of the world, like it's the case for me right now, no one needs to wait for, for you to wake up and get your computer to get the base, like a basic question answer. And it doesn't even need to be an artist. Sometimes uh, if, someone is, if you're doing the UI and someone wants to implement it, they can, you can like write every single detail of the UI for them to just like access it and it just makes it a breeze. Uh, and when you return to something that you haven't worked on in a long time, you can also like remember things just like that. Um, thanks to your press self. And, and a lot of the times folks from the same team can't work in the same thing at the same time. Uh, so documentation can keep your team at sync at all times. For example, if a designer came up with a creature and he just says, oh, this creature needs to have claws because that's the gameplay. Uh, you're gonna maybe you're gonna concept it while the, the audio person is gonna start it a few weeks later when they actually join the team. If you if you design it as a lion and you don't document it anywhere, the audio guy can come up with the sound of an ego and it's gonna be kind of like it's not gonna have any association. So it's it would feel kind of weird. So it kind of avoids all these kinds of bumps that you could run into. Yeah, and oh, in the, just just coming back to the video that I was doing, um, right now I like, I finished more or less a very rough sketch with the, the colors of the image and I brought it to, to A Sprite, which is the, the tool that I use for making pixel art. Usually I do 2D because I feel like, because I, I have a lot of difficulty focusing in general. If I, if I start with pixel art right away, I'm gonna be so focused on putting every single pixel into the right place that I'm gonna not pay attention to the composition of the image at all. So yeah, that's kind of what I was doing. No, I'm curious, like what, um, what brought you to, to, to doing like pixel art? Like I've seen your por portfolio, like, and yeah. like all, all I can draw for me is like uh, your work is very, very fluffy, very warm, very <laughs> cuddly. I don't know, like I get like all warm and cuddly just looking at it. I'm really glad. Like, and um, 
like like the love for pixel art like how did it uh, how was it born like why uh, pixel art it's it goes way back when i was a kid because i used to draw a lot but i also used to be on the computer a lot and i think at some and i also enjoyed fashion and that comes into play because i when i was i think 6 years old i found out about something called doll makers and back then they were all made with pixel art and i was and i would play with them all day long and then at some point i would reach like a limit and i would be like oh but i wanted my doll to be wearing another thing and one day i just my dad works with computers so one day i asked like how can i use the computer to draw on top of this doll and he just like showed me how to screenshot something open paint and said maybe you can do it here and then from then on, I just like kept doing it. And I think because of that, I found out about the like modding community and the hack games community of Pokemon. So I started like editing sprites and like that kept feeding into my whole pixel art thing. Awesome. I know because like, uh... I know that opinions on pixel art are very like polarized. Like a lot of people think it's a it's a thing of the past. Like don't bring it don't bring it up. But then like people who who like it, they really like it. Yeah. 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 And pixel art is like what people tend to forget is that we have different art mediums that reach different results. So like it's it would be the same as saying oh. Painting with gouache is, is a thing of the past because now we have digital art. So just yeah. like stop doing your painting with gouache. It's just, it's a means to end. Yeah. yeah. It's so funny that you mentioned uh, have, uh, um, your beginnings in fashion and designing clothes for your dolls. Yeah. Because I've been stalking your Twitter <laughs> and I realized that you've been uh, designing clothes for your Animal Crossing <laughs> uh, a character. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, uh, when I saw that, I was like, that's all I'm going to be doing on this game. It's just like when I was a kid doing like art for doll makers and yeah. And my mom was, was also a seamstress, so it kind of like all ties together, like every okay. single little thing. No, it's awesome that how, how we can like bring those like passions and hobbies from our, our childhood and like in, integrate them into into our um, our work today. Yeah, definitely. I don't think I would be like as passionate or even as able to focus because I, I have ADHD so I'm like all over the place but because it's something that I love so much it's and it's something that has to do with my childhood it's just like it's so easy to focus and just go yeah uh funny you should mention that like uh can we somehow like connect it with writing documentation like we know it's writing documentation is the most boring part of being in game development like people yeah. usually avoid it especially if they're in small teams they're like okay we, we're sitting next to each other i i will tell you everything i know but you most of the cases it's not enough it's really needed yeah. like to have have your own knowledge base uh knowledge base uh mm -hmm. but like how do you bring yourself like how do you mo motivate yourself and how do you motivate your team members to be uh, meticulous about um, putting that knowledge base base together. So I think for me it started because because I have ADHD I had to learn how to cope with the fact that I forget about things all of the time. It's not like it's not an option. It's not because I'm not paying attention. It's just how my brain is wired. So like as a teenager I started like having to write journals and when I would draw something I would like give a little note of like, oh, I didn't finish this part, maybe I need to come back later. And I was thinking of doing this, this and that. And it was a habit that I built myself. And when I came to the games industry and I started doing people management, I noticed I was really, really shy for a manager. And I, I looked at my journals, I was like, maybe if the journals and like the, the documentation that I usually do for my own art can help myself, maybe it can like bridge the gap of me being very very shy and having difficulty like giving feedback very easily mm -hmm. and it, it really helped it really really helped because uh we don't have I, th I think a bunny hug we've been working on this game for roughly three years and we have not have like we are not intense with meetings the communication is always there 
and I think uh, seeing that, I think when someone sees that coming from you, you're the one that initiates it, they, they kind of got inspired because I saw my, after my husband saw how I document UI, for example, which is very thorough, uh, he started documenting the game design that has been doing for, for a game very, very meticulously. So even he doesn't know how to draw because he's, he's a 3D artist, but he doesn't know how to draw. Even he doesn't do, he do like little sketches anyways, and he writes like full documents. And as he went along, he noticed that whenever, whenever he, needs, uh, he needs something done from the programmer, she can just check on that and he doesn't need to like stay up until 4 a.m. to talk to our programmer in Australia because he has everything so well documented. So it kind of like when someone in the team starts, I think other people in the team start seeing that as well. And I noticed that after a while, our programmer also started like at the end of the day, sending like a little, a little like, oh, this is what I did in my day and this is what I'm going to do next day. So it kind of came naturally, but I think it's, if you don't like staying in meetings all day, if you don't like spending like every waking hour as a manager on a meeting, it's it's a good argument for, for you to start doing it. I and don't... Yeah, and it's great that you as a manager, you're actually, uh, you're leading by, um, you're, you, you are a role model. Like, you, yeah. as you said, like you, you're the one doing it and new team members see, see you doing it and realize the importance of it. Yeah, exactly. Awesome. Lou, we have a question. Yeah, sure. So we have a question from Arben, who Hi. is asking if, um, uh, who's asking, he has a Microsoft uh, pen or, I have a Microsoft pen or CAD table. Can I use those to draw in this app? Well, can you please um, tell us again, which, uh, uh, which app are you using to create pixel art? And uh, yeah. So uh, this app is called A-Sprite. So it's A-S-E. P R I T E, okay. and you can absolutely use any sort of pen to 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 draw on this app because it's pixel art. It doesn't depend on pen pressure. So even if you don't have a fancy tablet, you can absolutely use it because you're gonna be controlling like things without that don't regulate size or transparency due to pen pressure because that's not a thing that uh, pixel art apps usually go for. So yeah, you absolutely can do it. Awesome, awesome, thank you. Thank you, Lou, mm -hmm. and thank you, Arben, for, for the question. I hope uh, everybody else uh, at this webinar, please don't be shy. Feel free to ask uh, all the questions in the in the chat. Yeah, of course. Okay, so Lou, where were we? <laughs> so uh, I think I was, okay, next I was going to talk about how like art directing your game can keep at least part of your game's budget and timeline under control, at least the part that you can you can help with. Like even if you're the only artist in your game, if you as you evolve as all, all artists do, you can't keep reworking on the same asset of your game over and over and over to keep up with your new art style. So if you make like examples of how you want things to look, you get to check that later and make sure that it's not like the not out of tone or not out of style from the uh, from things that you did previously and you're not gonna have to keep redoing stuff all the time um developing the uh, the expected arts that you want the sorry developing the art style that you want early on was, was gonna save a lot of time later because of that uh, it's better to spend a, a little bit of time like doing pre-production and preparing all of those things uh so you can like just kind of zoom to production more easily and another example is if you need to onboard a new artist or an animator in the middle of the project they're, they're gonna have like a easy, easy references to look at which is really good because they they can just come in and they're not gonna be very confused and you don't need to spend a lot of your your time that you should be doing other things for the for the game onboarding someone just you can like do the human aspect but you don't need to do like here's every single piece of the style. Uh, an example that happened very recently with, with us, a bunny hug, is that a few months ago we got a tech artist. In, he's working on the secret unannounced project right now. And it was a really big relief to introduce him to the team and then I just said like, look, this is the project, this is the team, 
and this is what you need to work on. It, it was already done because it was something that I did way like a few years ago. So like he needed to work on a specific shader and I had already broken down like every single layer that the shader would need. And I broken down the colors. I, I actually have an example here of how I broke that down. Can you show us? I'm gonna pause the video for a second. So it's gonna look ridiculous because it's censored. But yeah, so the, the, there's several of these files that I'm gonna show. So it's extremely broken down and it has every single little detail and how to approach everything. And I'm sorry, I can't show the, all the text and all and the uncensored image, but yeah, it's more like this, this thing that I had when I onboarded him and he, a week later had already started. He didn't have any questions. He just asked like, is this more or less what you were expecting? I know I have the document, but just, just want to confirm. And he did everything very fast and very perfectly, even though he was a junior. Awesome. Yeah. So how, um, how long did the pre-production stage of this new unannounced, we cannot talk about it project uh, actually, actually lasted? You mentioned that you've been, uh, that you founded uh, the studio uh, three years ago? Yeah, so the game started three years ago and the studio was founded a year ago. Mm -hmm. What happened was I was working on it part-time while I was still working at Chocofish. So the pre-production for the art itself lasted a long time. It lasted a year. Uh, in the meantime, the, the, at that point, we were co-developing with our publisher. And just because they wanted to try several prototypes of the same game and like see if things were working, they, were, uh, they didn't want to take a lot of risks. So they tried everything that, we, that uh, they could. And a year ago, when we funded the studio was when we actually did the actual production of the game, but I wasn't this entire time doing only for production. I was doing, I was already preparing assets and doing UI stuff because I didn't want to wait for a programmer to come in. So yeah, so it's been actual full production for a year and pre-production for art for a year, but I have two years of production of art itself. Mm -hmm. Awesome. So any advice for uh, indie teams out there, like how, um, when planning a project, like, what do you think, like, how, uh, how much time should they, um, uh, should they give, like, only for pre-production, like, and how actually important is the pre-production stage? Like, can you, um, like, does everything has, uh, do you like have to agree on everything in pre-production and then only start working? Or is it like possible to have like 70, 60% of it done and then start going to production and do all these things uh, along the way? Oh, we definitely can do things along the way. Actually, uh, I think even if you have 100% ready in pre-production, which is extremely rare, uh, at some point in the game, during the production, you're gonna notice, oh, actually the engine that we're working on or, or the platform that we're aiming for doesn't have the capacity to accept a, a specific shader that I thought about. So we're gonna have to dial back, rethink that, and we're gonna, so that happens a lot because it's, we're still messing up with technology, technology so it's very like, at one time things are gonna work and at another time it's not gonna work anymore. And yeah, uh, I recommend for time of pre-production, if you could do at least minimal a month, it would be great. I know some teams don't even have that and you don't need to agree on everything. I think you just need to put some groundwork and at least get some things agreed on so it's smoother throughout the process. But I think ideal, ideal world, you have the money or you have the time and you are working like your end of your job, you gave your notice, a, a big notice, you have money, maybe three months to six months pre-production would really smooth things out because you can think then you have enough time to discuss with your team members every single aspect that you want to discuss and agree on and maybe like maybe get to that 75% of pre-production done. I don't think, I don't think it's like for any games, it's going to be realistic to have a hundred percent done before the game starts. I think what happened to us was kind of like 
a bit messy. That's why I started working on, on art before the, the game programming actually came. Awesome. We have a, a great question uh, actually from uh, Mirza, yeah, Mirza. Uh, who is asking if you have multiple artists, what is the best technique for a manager to harmonize the style of the, um, of the game? So, um, uh, if you recall the, the document that I just showed you, I'm going to show it again. So, I do, oh, it's already open, sorry. Uh, if you see this, I usually do this for everything. So, I, I create concept art for the kind of sets, the, the style for various elements of the game. So, if you have a tree, how does a tree, how the tree shapes work and stuff like that. Uh, so like how, how do creatures get designed? What are the shape languages that we're going for? Uh, something very, very important is having like reference boards. Ref so you're creating your own by doing the drawings and actually showing like, oh, this is how like trees in this world should look. Whenever you need to make a, a new tree, just go back to that doc document and please look. But also, reference photos and reference images and little things that you can bring in a document and make it very organized is very like it's very helpful because maybe your artist is already pretty good at the art style that you're doing but they can't they don't get the type of tree that you want right uh, sorry that i keep using trees just the easiest thing if there's one right That's in front of me <laughs> <laughs> so like uh, maybe you're in a tropical location, so maybe you shouldn't have evergreens, but your other artist doesn't know about that. So having the references for all the, for like the species of trees that you think it's cool to have in your game helps a lot already because it's another, because our direction is not only the art style, but also the like keeping things more or less and like looking like they belong to the world that you're, you're making. And another thing is feedback is extremely important even if you're in a in a flat hierarchy so if all of you have the exact same position in the the team you need to give each other feedback like if someone did a character and they have eyes that never showed a, never showed in, in any other character in the game and if they're not very important to have like those different eyes someone gotta come in and say like look i think the eyes that we're going for for characters is this one this one, maybe we can try another time for a more important character, but it doesn't fit right now. So feedback, documentation, and references all the time is very important. And also, uh, like as people go along and they actually work on their on their art, they should be able to show, like they, they shouldn't be afraid of showing you the progress because that's when you catch like, oh, this is going too out of style. Let's Let's dial back a little bit. Awesome. Yeah. So the things you mentioned, you are actually uh, talking in more detail, uh, de in more detail about them in the second part of your of your talk. Actually, yeah. so uh, so Mirza, you will get a more detailed answer actually uh, throughout the throughout the webinar. Stay tuned. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. yeah so. so oh, yeah, sorry. sorry. <laughs> we keep repeating each other's sentences. <laughs> We're in sync. <laughs> Anything. that's good so uh we covered the pre-production and now what what do we do now Lou? okay when we start a project we need first before anything else we need to be conscious of a few things we need to know the skin the skills and the limitations of our team that involves the entire team not only your art team uh, including programmers and knowing what they can and cannot do uh, uh, your game's requirements and how the art's going to tie into the gameplay, the tone and the story and what you should avoid not to hinder any of that, as well as uh, engine limitations, platform limitations, uh, things, uh, even like rating limitations, like if something is not appropriate for the public that you're aiming for, you've got to keep that in mind. You need to know who your player base is and researching the market and the target audience is actually pretty important unless you're swimming in money. Like you don't need to follow one to one what is like trending and successful right now, but you need to research the market to know exactly what is not working and like completely scaring players away. 
Yeah, what are you what are you doing? Like, what is your approach like to to research, uh, researching the market? Like, do, what tools do you use? How do you uh, compare compare games? What are the, the what is the criteria you're looking for? Like, how do you, how do you do it? I think mean, a lot of um, a lot of us simply uh, since we like making games, we decide to make a game that we uh, we would play with our friends. Yeah. You know, but that doesn't necessarily mean that that game will be um, that will that game will be successful with other people. So, yeah. um, so can you yeah tell us like what is your approach to research and also has it ever happened that you you got an idea for a game and then did your research and realized oh, okay this isn't gonna work at this moment. So yeah. like yeah. how many ideas have been killed off by research? Oh God, uh, when we were pitching this game right now, we, ac we actually were in love with another project that we were working on. It was a, the other project that we were working on was a VR space horror diagram game. And when I researched the reach that we would have back like three years ago, because we wanted to do a very slow, very short uh, development cycle, we wouldn't be able to, even if we did really well we wouldn't be able to reach a lot of people and kind of like that kind of killed it because we wanted this game to be able to fund the future of the studio so it was like the game that we were most in love with and we were working on like on a side project for for a few months kind of just like got set aside and it's like we said bye and maybe one day we're going to be able to come back to it and like the research that I did was like, uh, back then I was looking on the journal itself. So I would go on Steam, I would go on consoles and I would say like, are people, at, I would check if people were paying attention, if there were loads of reviews or wish lists on those, uh, those games and what each people, like what are, were the criticisms, if the art was any way hindering the game or not. And a while ago, I used Steam Spy, but I got to know that it's not reliable. Yes, so I'm not exactly. sure. Yeah. And for for the VR project that we threw out of the window was, um, I was checking the sales of VR games and like how inaccessible it is for where I came from. Like in Brazil, nobody has it because it's extremely expensive, and I wanted people to play. And another kind of. It's an easier way of researching the market. Sometimes I keep in mind a person that I would like to play my game. Like there's a friend that only likes to play horror games, narrative games, and what exactly, like I, I like to think, to hear their thoughts and like what what other games on the journey they liked and stuff like that. It's, it's a bit more intimate because it's kind of like the way that it humanized a little bit more for me, but it's not, it doesn't work every time because not not every fan has like the right opinion about things but yeah that's more or less how i do it how um how hard is that process i mean like how many games do you have to do you usually um go through before you you tell yourself okay this is th I i've got enough information now but it really depends sometimes you like Sometimes you check the the Steam page of like a single game, and you see like if there is a uh, if I see a lot of toxicity, I'm like, oh, maybe that's not the journal for me because I'm a bit too sensitive of a person to to be dealing with uh, with that. So then I'm like, okay, let, it's done. I'm I'm done. It, I'm not gonna. Yeah, yeah. I like that criteria, like criteria for a game like avoid having a toxic online community <laughs> yeah like there's people that can handle it i just am not one of them i'm very very sensitive <laughs> and uh and sometimes it takes like it can take before we start or before we try to pitch something it can take a month or two of like looking virtually and talking to different people and like reaching to people that worked on those games and see like what they thought of, of their experience so it depends like how fast you can reach the conclusions, but I wouldn't say like, don't green light your game based on one. It's okay to not green light one based on one, but don't green light a whole project that's gonna last like one year to five years of your life based on a single single page that you visited. 
I like that that, that uh, you said something that I haven't actually um, ran across um, a lot, like contact the people who have made the game and ask them about their experiences. That's that's very good advice, actually. Yeah, I think it often it it bring it brings to light things that I haven't noticed before because sometimes you may have a lot of reviews because your game it has like very passionate fans but it doesn't that didn't actually translate to to the like the sales or not a lot of people know that game or or even like it's some it's a gameplay so difficult that it gave a lot of headache to the devs and if it's not something that you want to go for then it's just good to good to hear from them that's that's really really great advice okay (laughs) Uh, we have another uh, question, actually, uh, again from Arben, who was asking about the app and, and the pen. Oh, yeah. And now uh, he's asking, like, what is the maximum resolution that I can use in this application? And can I use 3D animations in HD quality or 4K quality? So for A Sprite, uh, I don't think it has a max. I think it, it, it goes as, as much, as big as your CPU or in GPU can allow uh, because it's pixel art, the higher resolution you go, the it get exponentially more time to to make anything and finish anything, because you're placing single pixels and having to polish all of that. So I don't recommend going like super high. Uh, it's this software itself that I'm that I'm working on right now is only pixel art, so it doesn't it doesn't have any 3D rendering or uh, you can take a screenshot of a 3D thing and like draw on top of it but it doesn't do 3d and it doesn't open 3d files at all okay uh arben i hope that we answered your questions uh thank you all for your feedback uh, we're getting uh, some feedback that this is a great talk uh, i'm really glad some- so this is going well good <laughs> <laughs> i'm glad <laughs> thank you all um okay so we have the we have covered the uh, the part of being conscious of our uh, team's capabilities and their limitations when uh, when designing a video game. Yeah. So, uh, what else should be should we pay attention to when starting starting a project? Yeah, I think another thing that we need to keep in mind always is that sometimes you're gonna have to sacrifice aesthetics for the things that I mentioned like oh no isn't that every artist's biggest fear that (laughs) that their art won't get the the attention it deserves and the praise it (laughs) always always every single project that I see with every single artist that I ever talk to unless they have an extremely high budget it always happens like yo but it doesn't mean you can't create something beautiful out of it it's just you're gonna have to sacrifice something that you wanted for something that it's gonna fit everyone else better yeah, but like, how do you how do you explain that to to an artist? Like, how do you get? Um, I wouldn't say like how do you, I wouldn't ask how do you get used to it because like, but how do you um, explain to an artist like why the why their piece isn't like entering the game or uh, why it isn't like isn't the centerpiece of of the game? Why why it maybe isn't the most important part of the game? Like, how do you? I think. One argument that I always have is like game games are mu- multimedia, which means art is only one aspect, one of the several aspects of a game. And sometimes an artwork can actually bring the rest of the game down. Even if it's the most beautiful art that you've seen in your life, if it doesn't work for the game, it doesn't work for the game. And it's it's really hard. It's really hard not to take this kind of thing personally. And I think it's both for the manager to be delicate enough while delivering that information and to the artist himself that or herself or themselves to, to like breathe, like receive the information, breathe and say, okay, yeah, it makes sense. I need to, I need to like bring this back to, to something that works for the game. It's a lot of talking. It's it's not easy conversation to have with people, and sometimes it just takes like you're gonna have the conversation, and you have to gonna have to let that person breathe for for themselves for a while to be able to take. Yeah, I'm guessing it's not easy like to have that conversation with yourself. Like oh. you're gonna put your 
ego aside and like like how how do I do this it's it's very very hard but um mm -hmm. yeah, the older I get the easier it gets but like in the beginning of this game I, I designed the shader that I was really in love with and then I noticed that it would like it would ruin performance of the game and I was like fuck <laughs> I really didn't want to get rid of all of this work like weeks of work and research that I had to do but I can't bring everyone else down because of my ego like it hurts me but it's okay I can be with that hurt a little bit it's gonna pass it's not that big of a deal at the end of the day just, I we're a year from now I'm gonna forget I guess <laughs> mm -hmm. but can you sometimes uh, actually like re can I say like recycle that that art oh. like reuse it for for something oh yeah like a lot of the times if you have something very beautiful that doesn't quite fit as an asset of the game make it a marketing art you can you can like especially if it's very like very polished or sometimes on the example of the shader that i was designing i just painted on top and pasted on top and like oh, okay this this is gonna actually if i remove this element i can it can make it more performant and if i add this other element it's gonna be oh it, the video actually ended i'm gonna put the next one and if i like put another element on top it's actually gonna simulate what i wanted before but it's gonna be actually performant so there's there's this kind of stuff that you gotta do you gotta if you don't have time especially you're gonna have to reuse things a lot it's it's good that it's not all in vain like yeah exactly <laughs> you can always find find a way awesome we have a, a question from noah, oh, hi, noah who first says thank you for the great talk Okay. and insights in your work and the art direction and he's interested like do you have some tips how to create a, a unique art style for a game within a short time frame okay yeah that requires for example uh i think it kind of goes through like the the thing that i was going to mention how to get started which is you go through you grab like a bunch of mood references which what mood references are is you're gonna look for colors that it would fit the tone of your game, uh, pieces that evoke emotion or photographs that kind of like remind you how the town is gonna look. And it's kind of like an overall look. When you look at it, you can kind of get the feeling of the game. You prepare that. And after that, you can like start sketching a lot, start sketching and start painting different colors and start like maybe if, if you have an idea for already for how the game is gonna uh, be presented on screen, not art style wise, but like composition, if it's an isometric game, you can try to sketch the screen of the game itself with three different art styles that you're gonna come up with based on that mood board. Sometimes you have like, and sometimes you have like a few illustrations that have a very specific style that you really love. And and you can try with those. You can try to adapt those to, to a gameplay kind of thing. And the more you iterate and the fastest you iterate, like don't try to finish up any of this work, just make it sketches, make it speed paints. The more you're gonna, the, the closer you're gonna get to actually finding the art style that you want. So yeah. Cool. Start with the mood board, Noah. Start yeah. with creating a mood board. Thanks, Lou. So after, um, yeah, would you like to tell us more about, uh, you mentioned like the, the mood board, the, the sketches, the experimentation. Uh, could we hear in more detail about each, um, each of those, th those stages? Of course. So uh, mood board, you have a few tools that you can use for it. There's Pinterest, Pure Ref, Dropbox folders, internal wikis, whatever you prefer. Uh, you just need to make sure it's organized. You have different kinds of boards. You have the mood board itself, which is like a more preliminary thing and something that you look back on when you are kind of losing the track of what your game was supposed to be, which happens sometimes. And, and you have a re reference board boards as well, which, uh, for example, if your game has a very specific theme, for example, your game is set in Brazil in the 1990s. Like what did, what did the town that you're making is gonna, should, looks like back in the 1990s. So you're gonna grab a bunch of photos of buildings, what what trees were in that area, 
you're gonna see how people dress and you're gonna make different boards for different references. And I actually have an example here. Just a minute. Okay. So this is a folder for our current project that I'm working on. It's censored again, but yeah. So everything is organized so you can find by name what you need. And sometimes I have big, big re uh, reference boards like overall fashion. And then I break it down to things that I need a lot, like middle-aged male player or middle-aged working female. So, and sometimes they're very disorganized because they are just there to, for me to have the images and then organize later with more boards. So like this is the overall fashion at the time of the game that I was working on, I'm working on. And then I have a board that is more specific for how would a middle-aged working woman dress on that area at that time. Uh, yeah, and I right now I'm using Pure Ref because in the beginning I started using wikis, mm -hmm. uh, a very internal, uh, internal wiki, but it required like kind of a bit of programming, a lot of formatting, and it was like, a lot for a single concept artist and a single 3D artist and a single tech artist to like look through. So I pulled it back, put on pre-ref on a Dropbox folder and then that's how I organized myself. And then after like I organized all of those things, I started experiment, experiment, bleh, experimenting, very hard word, sorry. And so I started sketching a lot. Like I mentioned before, I start doing paintings I make, like, I try to see like, oh, how would it like for the character's art style to be in this game? How would like to, for the background art style to be in this game? And out of that, I talk to, I go to a designer and I say like, what information do we need on the screen? What is the viewing angle of the, of this game? And from that I make uh, mock-ups. Uh, it is really hard, it's really easy because it's, not, it's easy for, helping people visualize what what the art, the game is going to look like in the future for like programmers and marketers and designers it helps everyone uh, and you're in that when you're making mock-ups you're you are defining art style yes but you also need to be working directly with the game designer to make sure that you're solving gameplay problems with him or her and meeting all the in-game expe uh, expectations mm -hmm. so you try to like focus really literally how the game would look on the screen yeah that's also great 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 advice like you have to work that you have to work closely with game designers with programmers actually with all other members of your team like to see as is, is your art like good, good um does it like can can be used in the game like there's a yeah, awesome. Yeah, exactly. uh, but um, I'm like curious, like wh who helps in, you're working in a small team. Yeah. So who's, and you are uh, an art director. So whose opinion actually do you value, value most when it comes to um, your art decisions? Like, do you ever, for example, like who do you turn to for advice? Like who, um, who do you rely to, like to keep you, to keep you in check? So uh, I'm gonna just do a rundown on my team. Currently we are eight. We are, we just hired a second programmer. So we are two programmers, um, me and my partner, uh, we are artists and he also happens to be the creative director. So he take care, takes care of the directing of the game design. And we have a musician and a sound designer. And we have a, someone that we have a tech artist as well. And we have a biz dev. So like who I rely to depends on what exactly I'm working on. If I'm working on like UI, I have a lot of, lot of experience with UI, UX, graphic design, app design, all of that, because it was what I started in my career with. So I usually like, I feel like my opinion in this matter matters more, but I also always rely to my partner to make sure, because he's creative director, making sure that it ties in with game design. So if it's something very aesthetic minded or UI minded, 
I usually go with myself. Mm-hmm. But if it's if it's something that is gonna be very tight to gameplay or very tight to like, it's gonna go along with a piece of music, or if it go or if it's a marketing piece. So I I rely to each other team member of ours. Like sometimes uh, our tech artist he he's still university, he's still a junior, but sometimes I would like to check with him if something that I'm working on actually is feasible. So if he says no, I'm gonna say, okay, I'm gonna rework on this. And sometimes if it's something just aesthetic, I'm gonna show to everybody and say, hey, how do you, do you like this? And if they don't, I'm gonna be like, okay, yeah, I, I can see why. And they give me feedback and I work on top of that feedback. So because it's such a small team, I wanna keep the team feeling like they're part of the process all of the time. So I kind of like relate to every to everybody all the time. So even if I'm directing, I don't don't wanna pressure anyone down. Cool. So the, this actually like answers the the question of like how do you make decision in a, in a flat hierarchy? Yeah, in a flat hierarchy is like a bit different because uh, sometimes everyone wants to speak very loudly at the same time about the same subject, and I what I learned is in flat hierarchies everyone is gonna be very intense on feedback, very, very intense. It was the case on the previous studio that I worked on. And like, you're gonna have to deal with knowing how to filter feedback. Uh, Like in that case, you're gonna kind of have to create a hierarchy inside of your mind to know who to rely, who is the, who specializes on the subject that you're working on right now. And they're the person that you're gonna kind of like listen to more. And also sometimes you, if you want to really go for a hierarchy, you don't want to set any, like, I have the last word person ever. You're going to have to deal with very long dev cycles and you're going to have to deal with loads of meetings. It's just either that or you talk to your team, look, I'm not looking for feedback right now. I'm showing what I'm working on right now. When I finish, let's do feedback so I can be a bit faster. So it's a lot of talking. Yeah, like, uh, we, we are, um, you know, like, people uh, imagine, like, game development as, as being this, like, super exciting area of work, and it is, but <laughs> they tend to forget, like, like, 50% of our work is, like, documentation, talking, meetings, feedbacking, documentation, like, exactly, so yeah. everybody really has to, has to have that, that in mind. <laughs> Yeah, even if you're shy like me, you don't get to like be on the corner all the time. You gotta, you gotta come in and you gotta talk and you gotta, yeah. It's, yeah, you gotta like get out of your comfort zone because that's, I mean, that's the only way that you and a team of people can, um, can find a common ground and actually like give, bring something excellent to, to life, like to, to the audiences. Um, oh, Okay, Luciana, we are uh, receiving uh, more and more praise on your work. Uh, oh, yeah. So uh, Dragana is telling us how uh, the art you're creating is magnificent. Thank you. And uh, since we mentioned the references, uh, she asked if you, uh, if you feel that, uh, do you have enough experience to design, draw and paint without reference? I definitely do. And actually in the beginning of my career, I for some reason I would refuse to use references at all. What I do, uh, what did lead me to like relying solely on references and then going back to maybe I don't need that much references is that before an art piece, I like to study the things that I'm gonna be putting on the art piece. So if I'm gonna draw, in this case, I'm gonna be adding three dogs to this piece. I'm gonna look for references of how dogs like behave how are they, how they pose in certain situations. I'm gonna like just do a bunch of sketches, see how the anatomy works. And then I'm gonna go to the piece and I'm gonna sketch it and I'm gonna draw it and stuff like that. So I, I'm not looking at references all of the time, but I do use it still because even if I have a lot of experience, sometimes your mind slips a little bit and you forget like which side, which side should I put the thumb of this animal or and stuff like that. And it's sometimes it, you just want to draw and be able to not think that you're going to be committing, like making a bunch of mistakes. So you just reference back. But yeah, I, when I'm sketching freely, I don't look at references, but if I'm going to do a final piece that is going to take me five to 10 hours to finish, I'm going to look at references because I want to put my best into it. 
Yeah. Okay, Dragan, I hope that we answered your question. And also before we uh, get back to, to your talk, we have a, a, a curious question, like what are uh, the art you are showing us now? What are you gonna use it for? So uh, I've been doing like a series, I don't know if it's a series or not, but it's, uh, I've been doing pieces that involves like my dogs more or less. <laughs> Yeah, dogs, uh, are, is, dogs are a frequent theme, or theme on your work. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> like, they're a big part of my life. They help me a lot of, like, mental health stuff. And so, like, a few years ago, I did a piece that was when I received my puppy, like, and I had another dog, and I wanted to, like, feel like he was, I wanted to make him, like, welcome. So it was a piece to welcome him. The second piece that I did was two dogs going towards a tree that had, like, a a light into it and it was because because I wanted to reference the two dogs like growing together and like having adventures together they had like two backpacks and stuff like that and this one it's more of a personal piece and it's uh one of my dogs passed away and adopted another dog uh recently so I wanted to include the three of them but like the other two are having like they're exploring together and like there's one in the back she's still there but she is like not there there so it's personal but it's also something that if one day like like a gallery would like to show the three pieces together it would be lovely like it it's, really it's lovely. a series thanks. for myself yeah thanks for sharing this story it's really um it's close to home yeah <laughs> um okay uh so i hope that we answered all of your questions uh but also uh i'm reminding you like whatever as you can see Lucia uh, Lou is very open to uh, all of your questions so feel free to ask whatever you whatever you would like yeah definitely okay so uh, we got to um, mood boards to references to concept art to mock-ups and to concept art yeah. and what comes what comes next Lou? next is don't forget your UI Please oh, don't forget your UI. It's part of art. It's definitely part of art. Maybe the UX is not your specialty. It's okay. You have game designers to work with, or maybe you can do some research on it. But when you're doing your mock-ups, when you're doing concept art, when you're grabbing your reference boards, please bring all of that to UI as well and integrate it. Like uh, the UI is, is like an artistic way that gives, uh, is meant to give the player a lot of important information. If that interface feels any way divided from the in-game art direction, the player is gonna feel at odds with the information that are being given. And this falls like both in UX and UI. Have you ever walked out of a, uh, out of a game because of bad uh, UI? I, I know I have. <laughs> <laughs> and I have refused to play games too because I saw that the UI would completely drive me nuts. It might be like the artist thing, but also I, I know a lot, a lot of people have struggled with some games because of the UI itself. Yeah, awesome. Yeah. And I think like even if your UI is going to be 100% diegetic, it's still UI, so you, you got to put standards to it the same way that you do with the rest of the art. And I think next, I would like to talk about communication, which is oh, yeah. let's, not let's the fun art of that. making. Yeah, like yeah. throughout our uh, our talk, you, you, you've been meshing like how um, how shy shy you are, and yeah. how uh, it took you a lot of a lot of time and courage to to step out and to, to communicate, and also how important it is to you, um, for you and for people around you to be to be nice. Yeah, yeah. definitely. So. <laughs> yeah, like because I'm so shy, I like when once I started doing the whole like bringing the documentation to my team and stuff. I found out that it smooths the developing process a lot. Like I would hear like programmers and game designers talk about like, oh, I never updated the GDD or like, oh, I never, or the programmer saying, oh, the programming documentation is like completely out of date as well. But like, it's not something that when you're shy like me or even when you're working with a team that is all over the globe, you cannot afford to not update your documentation at all. As I mentioned before, my current project has been rolling for three years and this entire time, like there were people that were remote. Right now, our team is like all over the world. We have a 17 hour difference between the person that's further, the, the two people that are furthest away. 
And when you keep everything documented, uh, in like very organized, which is also important, uh, and updated, uh, it kind of like, it helps a lot with keeping healthy work hours with your team members, because as I said, we can't keep, we can't be up at 4 a.m. waiting for a programmer to like have a question for us to answer to then be able to go to sleep. So it helps a lot with kind of like communication in general. So, uh, it has avoided being on extensive meetings because sometimes meetings are brought up because you need to a very simple answer like, oh, sorry, I don't know how to design a character for this game. Like, what are your standards? They don't need to do a meeting for that. They, they, all they can do is just like, oh, I'm gonna go on the folder for character design and like it's gonna have a uh, it's gonna have a PNG file saying the standards for character designing X game, and it's gonna say what's the shape language that you wanna use, like what the mood that you wanna reach with every single character, like if you have like lists of what the character is meant to do, it's also helpful. So it just avoids a lot of unnecessary back and forth. And like the back and forth that you end up having is a bit more meaningful because it's feedback and it's, yeah. And like a thing, a very important thing about communication is that you need to understand that some things gotta give. Uh, like you gotta adapt their direction um, so it's feasible for all the different experience levels and skills uh, in the team. Uh, very recent example again this current work that i'm doing is uh it, the game is voxel art and i'm not a voxel art specialist but my partner is so i do and he's very like he knows how to make things performant and he knows what works with his with like the art style of the art media of voxel so i just do my concepts the way i usually draw which is very shapely very like chubby and fluffy and from that, he can find the best solutions, things that perform well, things that are gonna be well visualized within voxel art. Uh, yeah, and, and also I, one big thing for me is directing people gently. Like, uh, as I mentioned before, I'm very, very sensitive. Uh, and I don't believe doing to others what I wouldn't like done to myself. And I found out that like this approach that I've been having works for a lot of people. Um, so like, because of all of that, I know like rudeness, like being very intense on the criticism or like being very short on the feedback and never acknowledging what people did right. It can really hurt morale. I saw that happen like firsthand. Like I have been on the receiving end of like this kind of feedback giving. Mm -hmm. Uh, and part of like gentle direction is remembering that you're directing people and people having feelings. And most of the time they answer for, from po like positive interactions with other people. I'm constantly practicing how should I give feedback that is construct constructive rather than destructive. Mm -hmm. So I acknowledge when people did right, what, what works for the game. Uh, I acknowledge, I don't, I don't go super strong, but I acknowledge what doesn't work. And I, instead of just saying, oh, sorry, this piece that you did doesn't work for the game, bye, you just like, I like what, thank you for the work. Uh, here's the reason why, like, here's the feedback and the reason why this part of the piece doesn't work. And maybe here's a su suggestion of how to make it like fit on the art style or work better for the gameplay. Or maybe it's just- you, Yeah, how often do you give feedback to your, to your teammates? Like, do you, um... Uh, do, do you have the habit of like showing each other's work after like each each tiniest thing or do you like have milestones okay after uh, we have our weekly feedback feedback sessions in which we review all that we have done during the past seven days or do you do it like yeah so because uh, because of the whole documentation thing uh, there is very little need for people to consult with me like oh, is this in the, the style that is intended for the game? So we don't do feedbacks of every single little work in progress that we have. Uh, sometimes we finish pieces even, and the only feedback is usually like, oh, uh, maybe, you sh uh, maybe that rock should be this color because that color is not 
it's not exactly following color palette. And a lot of the times the answer that I get is like, oh, oh yeah, sorry, I, it was a temporary color, I'm fixing it. So it's not very frequent because of the documentation itself. So we have, uh, we've been working with uh, weekly goals and monthly milestones. And usually by the end of the day, or if we finish a piece or, or even like by the end of the month, if something new has been done and hasn't been shown yet, we're gonna show and then we, we share. When, because we're all in different time zones, we kind of don't wanna be like completely flooding uh, a chat as well for that. Awesome. I'm yeah. guessing that like, since you emphasized how important uh, the documentation and pre-production is for keep and, and meetings, uh, are uh, important for like keeping that healthy uh, life work balance. Mm -hmm. I'm guessing that like um, that you manage to avoid uh, crunching and as we know like crunching tends to bring out the worst uh, <laughs> the worst in us and then we tend to um, uh, how can I say like we aren't as attentive or nice as we would usually usually be in in these situations and it's i mean it's horrible uh, yeah yeah I, I, we were really lucky that because of all of that we were able to avoid crunch and sometimes and sometimes if we need like if something needs to be done where we prefer to kind of cut features off than to make people go insane because of work um like um and one one thing, one very important thing is that like, even if we're not crunching, there, there are days that we're gonna be not feeling great. Something horrible happened, like some, someone like messed with you in the streets and now you're not, not feeling so great or you just woke up in the wrong mood. And sometimes you're not gonna react great to like a piece of feedback. Even I sometimes won't react great to a feed, piece of feedback that I received, but it's very important to keep, keep in mind that like, it's okay after that, take a breather. And if you got it wrong, say sorry. Like if you were accidentally rude to people, just don't let that pass. Say you're sorry, say, I'm not gonna, I'm gonna avoid doing that. I'm gonna think before I type. And sometimes if the other person was in that situation, it is important to give them space. And once they're a bit calmer, you can go and approach them, not only public because you don't want to feel like people are being called out in front of everybody. You go on a private chat and just say like, look, this wasn't, this wasn't very cool. Like maybe next time, like you can, you can give like pointers on how they can receive feedback a bit better. It's really hard because uh, a lot of, there's loads of people that are not good at receiving criticism whatsoever, especially like like in my case, because of ADHD, it's like, it's a symptom of ADHD, but it's something that you got to practice. And because the people around me were really understanding, I managed to like calm that down a lot. Awesome. Awesome. No, we had a very, um, I don't know if any of our attendees were present at Play UK in, uh, in Belgrade, uh, which was held in March, uh, as I remember. And we had a, a lecture from Jodi Azar, who was, uh, and it just surprised me. Like she said, like I haven't done an hour, like I have never crunched in my whole career, and oh, I wow. am, um, and I am very opposed to that idea yeah, that yeah. like crunching is an inter 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 integral. Sorry, I'm having problems <laughs> with pronounce pronunciation now. Integral part of of, of gaming. Yeah. So, yeah, definitely. Yeah. I think I managed most of my career. The times that I were, was working a lot, it was usually because I was saving money and working several different contracts. But even so, I was forcing myself to only do like, I have eight hours of the day to do this. If I can do this in eight hours, why am I going to bring my health down because of work? Yeah, that's, that, 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 that's a healthy atti attitude, actually. Yeah, very yeah. healthy. Cool. Uh, so, um, gentle direction. Yeah. That's important. So, uh, we have, uh, like, since we are, we only have like 10 more minutes of our webinar. Yeah. Uh, could we, uh, maybe what, what else would you like to share with us in, in the next, in the next 10 minutes? 
So I think uh, it would be good to talk about like the full, when you're going for production. Mm -hmm. uh, like, uh, for example, there is one thing specific that I wanted to mention that in indie games and when you have small budgets, it's really important to try to make everything that you do in the game usable somehow. Like if it's something that you, if it's a concept that really can't be used, don't use loads of your time making it like you can use on experimenting it, it and all this stuff, but you shouldn't be like finishing it and polishing it over and over again because with time the, the budget runs out. Um, so for example, in Wargroove, because I was the only, Wargroove when I was working for Chocofish, because I was the only person working on it for, I think three to six months, I don't remember, and there was nobody else. I noticed that it was very important for me to just like get going with things. I was the only dev. So instead of doing the traditional route of concept art in 2D and then I do pixel art and then I do like loads of sketches and stuff like that, I talked to the studio and I like got more or less of an answer from them what they were looking into in terms of art style. I developed one and I was really lucky that that one that developed uh, directly into a mock-up was exactly what they wanted, but the team wasn't exactly what they wanted. So I'm gonna show the first few mockups of uh, Wargroove. So this is what like I came up with and I was really lucky that I really liked this uh, art style. And I didn't actually even, I think I came up with this first and when they liked it very much, I managed to move to the other two um, but they didn't like the theme, so I tried to be as fast as possible, and I used pixel art because, in very small pixel art, because that would have the quickest turnaround, and I tested stuff, and I was trying to show the rest of the studio that wasn't working the game at the time, like, oh, what, what if we do, like, a cats versus dogs kind of theme, and they were like, we like the idea, but maybe you can try another one, and then we did the whole fantasy theme, and that's what stuck. So uh, on that on that game, because I was the only member of the team for so long, I didn't have the affordance to be doing a lot of sketching and stuff like that. So I was trying to do a little bit of quicker iteration. And on this current game, it's more traditional and traditional route. But there's one thing that I always do is if I'm doing a piece of concept art that can be used for UI, if like it's, a, it's gonna become an illustration that's gonna become UI, or if it's something that can be use for marketing, I'm gonna keep that in mind. And if it's something that is not gonna be used for marketing or UI or anything, I'm not gonna put as much like polishing effort into it at all. I just keep moving with it. Um, yeah, like it's also important to keep in mind that even if you have like all the pre-production done, certain aspects of the game are gonna have to go through constant iteration like the shader that I mentioned earlier. Uh, so like if you have a concept artist that can be taking care of that, it's great. If not, it's on the art director. Uh, but it's also important to keep that in mind. Uh, yeah, I think it's more or less that. <laughs> awesome, awesome. So um, I have a, like, uh, we're not getting any questions in the chat. So uh, I have a question actually, um, like, uh, you as an artist, like what are, what is the best way uh, to um, to showcase your art and actually like to get noticed? And also this goes for your indie game, like or uh, what what are the like the best um, what is the best way to uh, spread the word about what you what you do? Definitely for indie games, it feels like the major focus has always been Twitter. It has been for the past like ten good ten years. Um, I know there's people that actually look like publishers and stuff like that, that actually look into Saturday, uh, screenshot, screenshot Saturday. Saturday yeah. yeah. Like for example, Colin that works with us, he, he's also, he also works with publishers and he always look, looks there every week. So, and even for art, for art itself, Usually Instagram is like the bigger platform, but because you're making art and you probably want to bring like some of the public that likes your art to your game, focusing on Twitter helps a lot because everyone is kind of there. Uh, there's other, dep depending exactly on 
on your goal as an artist, if you want to be like a concept artist for a AAA studio, a place that they look a lot is often an uh, art station. Uh, and we can't forget that it's very important, even if nobody like searches for it and constantly access it, it's important to have a portfolio because sometimes on Twitter it can be kind of messy. And mm -hmm. if someone that wants to work with you or someone that is looking to fund your project, they want to have quick access to your art, they need to be able to access a portfolio that looks clean. It's important, very important that the portfolio looks clean so it just shows, showcases your art and nothing else. Mm -hmm. So what, which platform has been, um, have you used the most and has brought you, uh, I don't know, the, 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 most, the most work? It was definitely Twitter. I think Twitter first for work and then I got some work out of Reddit, like indie game dev uh, area, but it was 100% Twitter because all of the indie devs were there. And when I was working freelancer, uh, I would say like, hey, I'm looking for work, hashtag pixel art. Here's, here's all the, the pixel art that I can do. So yeah, a lot comes from there. I think every, everyone in the games industry kind of goes towards that direction. Also, yeah, so yeah, that's another advice for all the ar artists out there. Like, don't be shy. Yeah, definitely. Yeah open your social media profiles and follow like the um, follow the hashtag like start to finish or screen saturday like use okay. it use yeah, it yeah uh, if, if there's a new trend coming please join in find a way of joining <laughs> in <laughs> awesome so uh lou what are your um what are your plans with uh, with bunny hug what are the plans for your game can you at least tell us something about that so um what i can say is that we're looking into announcing sometime this year, I think. <laughs> I'm hoping we're waiting for a really long time. We've been on talks to a few platformers, platforms, hoping something comes out of it. If not, we're definitely a plan is to go open dev. So after we announce, we're going to show everything that we're doing. And that's another thing. Like, that's the moment that you can use even your like shitty concept art sketches to like bring people to your game. So that's, that's a plan that we have. Other than that, it's what well, I think we, what we said so far was that we were working with really cool folk. We we're working with Carlo Underwood. We we're working with uh, Shelly Lowe. She used to work at Armello. Uh, we we're working with Lena Rain, which did the, the music for Celeste. So like a lot of really cool people. And, and also I think the only other thing that we did was that we we're working on a slice of life kind of game it's very wholesome and that's kind of the plans for bunny how to keep doing wholesome games because i'm not very into like violent things i like like dark themes as in like sad stories but i don't like gory things so like the plan is bring a bit more happiness to this world with yeah, games like, gory things usually attract the toxic online community yeah. and we said like that's one that's one thing we want to we want to avoid yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Well, thank you. Thank you so much for sharing your plans with us. Thank uh, you so much. Before we wrap up, is there anything else that you would like to share with uh, with our audience? I think there's one last thought is that like our direction not, doesn't necessarily mean creating the most beautiful game you can or the most high value art. Our direction means taking consideration like every single aspect of a game and like helping the other folk from your team communicate that through your art so yeah thanks thank you thank you so much you. i have enjoyed this webinar and i hope that uh all our attendees have enjoyed it um lou i would like to thank you for your time for thank your you so efforts much. for your kindness uh <laughs> And before we part ways, I would also like to thank uh, all uh, British Council uh, partners in the Western Balkan region who are helping us bring all this content uh, to you. Uh, please head out to British Council uh, website to discover, um, discover this month's content and also make sure to follow us for next updates. Lou, again, thank you so much thank for you so much. being with us today. And uh, thank you all for listening. Thank you all for your questions. Uh, all the best. And I will see you soon. Bye. 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 Thank you.